Welcome to The Christian Atheist, where faith and reason fuse in the Incarnation. Episode number 124. Conclusion of Chesterton's Everlasting Man. An Outline of History, Part 2. G.K. Chesterton's The Everlasting Man is usually called a Christian apologetic work, but in the same sense in which I do not consider myself a Christian apologist, I do not think this book is, in substance, a Christian apologetic, but rather a pursuit of truth through a neutral corrective to a narrow-minded and limited popular rationalization. If we concede most of Chesterton's points in The Everlasting Man, one could still believe that humanity, Christ and Christianity, are explicable. The credibility of such an explanation is an entirely different question, in a variety of ways. He is, in his own inimitable way, seeking to lay aside the distortions to human experience engendered by a certain highly rationalized approach to history, which he sees as deeply reactionary and biased almost like a phenomenologist or a Sartrean ontologist, he is trying to first establish what it is that requires explanation, and only in a secondary sense to suggest that the orthodox view of Christianity is the best explanation for it. The latter goal, as I see it, is the apologetic mission. Rather than offering reasons to believe in Christianity, which by default is, I agree, a secondary effect of this work, he offers reasons to doubt the dogmatic, complex, and highly rationalized theories that systematically dismiss the more traditional viewpoint. As he says in the introduction, I do not pretend to be impartial in the sense that the final act of faith fixes a man's mind because it satisfies his mind. But I do profess to be a great deal more impartial than they that is, the critics, are, in the sense that I can tell the story fairly, with some sort of imaginative justice, to all sides, and they cannot. By fairly laying out what it is that requires explanation, without assuming or rejecting an explanation, he seeks to return us to the neutral agnostic ground from which we might more objectively weigh the proposed explanations. This, I do not think, is apologetics, properly speaking. And this, though I did not know it when we started, is the fundamental type of argument I sought to make in The Christian Atheist. I trust truth to win out when evidence and reason are given a fair and unbiased hearing. I wish to clear the ground of the accumulated clutter of metaphysics that we have mistaken for evidence, for objective fact and for reason. This, to me, seems also the objective of the everlasting man, and by extension of this brief outline of history in this concluding chapter we are analyzing. Keeping this in mind, we return to Chesterton's conclusion, picking up with what ends up being an outline summary of the second part of the book, The Man Called Christ. Just as man appears, when fairly viewed, a radical exception to the natural backdrop. Humanity itself forms a backdrop characteristically fascinated by the search for meaning and foundation, the religious impulse, endemic to all human history. We might call this backdrop human nature. Humanity seeks always to peek beyond the veil of our ignorance and finitude at that being beyond that origin from which our world and we ourselves have come. We sought those glimpses with myths and philosophies. This fundamental human desire, this search and its various resolutions, forms the large-scale background against which something new arises. Quote, right in the middle of all these things stands up an enormous exception. It is quite unlike anything else. It is a thing final, like the trump of doom, though it is also a piece of good news, or news that seems too good to be true. 
It is nothing less than the loud assertion that this mysterious maker of the world has visited his world in person. It declares that really, and even recently, or right in the middle of historic times, there did walk into the world this original, invisible being, about whom the thinkers make theories and the mythologists hand down myths. The man who made the world. That such a higher personality exists behind all things had indeed always been implied by all the best thinkers, as well as by all the most beautiful legends. But nothing of this sort had ever been implied in any of them. As man was the exception to nature as backdrop, so Jesus is the exception to man. He was a man, just as man was natural. As God's man stands relative to nature, so as God stands out Christ in human history. The final phrase of this quote, of course, is where the sticking point lies in modern reasoning. But it is also where the point of the outline lies. Was Jesus an exception, or simply one more in a long line? Do we rub out the line, or accept it as we find it? We hear of the dying God in mythology of varying incarnations of deities. But it is simply a truth that none of these myths or historical sages claims to be the being behind the veil, the source of being itself. This claim is unique, radically unique. Again, we are not presenting this outline to justify the claim but merely to recognize it for what, in fact, it was. Quote, something utterly unlike anything else in nature. It is the one great startling statement that man has made since he spoke his first articulate word, instead of barking like a dog. Its unique character can be used as an argument against it, as well as for it it would be easy to concentrate on it as a case of isolated insanity. But it makes nothing but dust and nonsense of comparative religion. It is, in this sense, the most incredible of all the incredible claims of man that the Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. That eternal creative reason which made the Quote, green architecture that builds itself without visible hands, as we saw earlier in this conclusion, condescended into that architecture, that history, in a single time and place, working with visible hands to redeem that history. To call this claim insane is reasonable. To say it is just one among a series of similar claims is utter nonsense. Try as we might, this line cannot be rubbed out, which is why we are still debating it 2,000 years after it was drawn. Continuing with our outline of history, subsequent to the line being drawn, we encounter the ripples in the pond from that single unique stone in the midst of the pond of history, the logic of historical reaction. Those eyewitnesses of the stone dropping into the pond cascaded outward, carrying onward the wave energy of that isolated moment in time, propagating those waves in a complex and seemingly endless energy of troughs and peaks. The messengers of the gospel thought they were carrying news to the world. They still think so. Christians carry the news as if it were a fact. They believe it is a fact. Whether or not it is a fact is not our concern here. We are not yet doing apologetics. Christians, from the first, were messengers, and, quote, a messenger does not dream about what his message might be 
or argue about what it probably would be. He delivers it as it is. It is not a theory or a fancy, but a fact. The history of the Christian Church is an apparent miracle, for its message, unlike its messengers, did not die. Its ripples continue and neither blend with nor are overcome by the other waves in the pool of whatever origin. Quote, I desire merely to mark those main lines, and specially to mark where the great line is really to be drawn. The religion of the world, in its right proportions, is not divided into fine shades of mysticism, or more or less rational forms of mythology. It is divided by the line between the men who are bringing that message and the men who have not yet heard it or cannot yet believe it. End quote. But of those who have not yet heard it or cannot yet believe it, we often fail to remember that they, too, remain part of that vast human backdrop from which Christ stands out. The central distinction is not between believer and non believer but between those who believe in the exceptional Christ and those who do not. All are part of the historical mosaic of mankind, standing within that vast liquid background into which Christ plunged. Our metaphysical commitments and our language obscure this line, rub it out. But if we simplify and strip away the complex metaphysical assumptions, quote, when we say that a country contains so many Moslems, we really mean that it contains so many monotheists, so many men, with the old, average assumption of men, that the invisible ruler remains invisible. They hold it along with the customs of a certain culture and under the simpler laws of a certain lawgiver. But so they would if their lawgiver were like Hergus or Solon. They testify to something which is a necessary and noble truth, but was never a new truth. End quote. Likewise, the Eastern traditions, quote, when we say that the country contains so many Confucians or Buddhists, we mean that it contains so many pagans whose prophets have given them another and rather vaguer version of the invisible power making it not only invisible, but almost impersonal, end quote. I would expand upon Chesterton here. When we say that a population contains so many materialist scientists or atheists, we mean that we too have men that, like the Eastern mystics, believe in a vague and impersonal invisible power behind the veil of appearance for they believe both in reason and in a discoverable truth. But they deny, even to themselves, their belief as belief, and in doing so radically distinguish themselves from human history, reinforcing the very realities they seek to deny. Their prophets have been pontificating, though, not on a new doctrine, but simply proclaiming what man has always believed, the added twist of denying the historically obvious while reveling in the denial. For denial or acceptance is the true line of division in human history, emanating concentrically from first century Judea. And all attempts to rub out that line, to blur or obliterate it, have failed. And here we venture into closing comments that are apologetic in nature. And perhaps it will be best if I minimize my commentary and allow Chesterton to speak. Quote, I have great sympathy with the monotheists, the Moslems or the Jews, to whom Christ seems a blasphemy, a blasphemy that might shake the world. But it did not shake the world. It steadied the world. End quote. The message 
has all the surprising characteristics of a fact. It appears in history, unexplained, in many ways unanticipated. Anything else might have happened, but this happened, and neither the Jews nor the pagans expected it, nor indeed found it easy or particularly desirable to believe. Quote, I think it a piece of plain justice to all the unbelievers to insist upon the audacity of the act of faith that is demanded of them. I willingly and warmly agree that it is, in itself, a suggestion at which we might expect even the brain of the believer to reel. End quote. But again, we return to the historical reality, the fruit of the gospel in history and in man, the contingent reality of what, in fact, happened. Quote, this madness has remained sane. The madness has remained sane when everything else went mad. The madhouse has been a house to which, age after age, men are continually coming back as to a home. That is the riddle that remains. That anything so abrupt and abnormal should still be found a habitable and hospitable thing. End quote. And it has been thus from the beginning. The incredible new doctrine, that radical departure from the background of belief, was news. Quote, Jews demand signs, and Greeks search for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Chesterton continues, I care not if the skeptic says it is a tall story. I cannot see how so toppling a tower could stand so long without foundation. Still less can I see how it could become, as it has become, the home of man. Had it merely appeared and disappeared, it might possibly have been remembered or explained as the last leap of the rage of illusion, the ultimate myth of the ultimate mood in which the mind struck the sky and broke. End quote. Christianity, Chesterton suggests, might make sense as the last gasp of the religious impulse, the final and most outrageous reach for that transcendent reality behind the veil that, when it failed, would break the mind that held on to the superstitious religious impulse. Quote, but the mind did not break. It is the one mind that remains unbroken in the breakup of the world. If it were an error, it seems as if the error could hardly have lasted a day. If it were a mere ecstasy, it would seem that such an ecstasy could not endure for an hour. It has endured for nearly 2,000 years. And the world within it has been more lucid, more level-headed, more reasonable in its hopes, more healthy in its instincts, more humorous and cheerful in the face of fate and death than all the world outside. For it was the soul of Christendom that came forth from the incredible Christ, and the soul of it was common sense. Though we dared not look on his face, we could look on his fruits, and by his fruits we should know him. End quote. We are engaged in our modern world, in that spirit of denial, in tearing down the Christian orchard from which the fruit emerged, as Satan stood in heaven's perfect purity and plenty, finding it intolerable, and resenting his own 
position in the divine order of things. The audacious faith in that blazing human exception, the soil from which came the fruit that fed mankind, literally and figuratively, seems still, from the outside, so incredible that we could reasonably expect the minds of believers to reel, as he said above. Quote, but the brain of the believer in Christ does not reel. It is the brains of the unbelievers that reel. We can see their brains reeling on every side and into every extravagance of ethics and psychology, into pessimism and the denial of life, into pragmatism and the denial of logic, seeking their omens in nightmares and their canons in contradictions, shrieking for fear at the far-off sight of things beyond good and evil, or whispering of strange stars where two and two make five. I wanted to comment usefully on this passage, but I find Chesterton's portrait of the modern mind here unaugmentable. I will simply read it again and ask you to bring to mind the gender reassignment surgeries, the ethical, in quotes, demand for abortion and death with dignity, the intolerant, unequal, monomaniac, and closed-minded demand for tolerance, equity, diversity, and open-mindedness, and the yard signs claiming that science is real and love is love, the ongoing attempt to rub out the one line that makes sense of the world. The Christian outline within which sanity and logic and love has, and might again, flourish. But the brain of the believer in Christ does not reel. It is the brains of the unbelievers that reel. We can see their brains reeling on every side and into every extravagance of ethics and psychology, into pessimism and the denial of life, into pragmatism and the denial of logic, seeking their omens in nightmares and their canons in contradictions, shrieking for fear at the far-off sight of things beyond good and evil, or whispering of strange stars, where two and two make five. Meanwhile, Chesterton continues, this solitary thing that seems at first so outrageous in outline remains solid and sane in substance. It remains the moderator of all these manias, rescuing reason from the pragmatists, exactly as it rescued laughter from the Puritans. I am a Christian, with the searching and skeptical mind of an atheist. I don't want to believe anything that isn't true. I know both sides of the looking glass, and I know them with open eyes. I choose Christ's side. I invite you to join me from wherever you stand before the looking glass. That's this week's episode. Thanks for listening. And remember, you can have your religious cake and eat it too. You can have reason, respect for science, a 21st century worldview, and be a Christian. <laughs>